I'm Jamie Hubbs, Assistant Superintendent for the Deposit Taking Supervision Sector. It's my pleasure to be your virtual host today. This year's seminar obviously looks quite a bit different. A lot has changed in a year, and we know the past eight months have been very challenging. The Canadian financial system, including OSFI, is functioning through a real stress test, testing our collective resiliency. Although none of us could have predicted this particular health crisis, many of the challenges facing the financial system today are elements that we have been preparing for. Canadian banks entered this crisis from a position of strength, equipped with higher quality and quantity of capital, stronger liquidity standards, improved operational resilience and innovative operating solutions. We are seeing the benefit of these preparations now and the results suggest that you and your organizations are currently managing existing and emerging risks and adjusting effectively. That said, no one is declaring victory. While the news about vaccines is encouraging, we are currently in a second wave. We are all experiencing COVID-19 fatigue and there continues to be real impacts on people's lives in the economy. Looking forward, we can expect that the economic recovery from the pandemic will be long and challenging heightening existing risks and revealing new ones that will require at attention and action. Things are changing quickly in this environment. At OSFI, we must respond appropriately as we strive to preserve confidence, remain ever vigilant, and always be improving. These three principles make up the vision that is central to our strategic plan. This year marks the first anniversary of OSFI's strategic plan the plan has served us well, especially through this crisis. It provided us with our strategic directives, direction and kept us focused on what we needed to do, which is to deliver our mandate regardless of the economic conditions and operational realities. The pandemic has led both the financial industry and regulators to course correct and work differently. At OSFI, we have needed to adjust to be more agile, resilient and collaborative. Specifically, we are working to be flexible to new realities, new issues, and new ways of working, increase, increase our capacity to react and thrive in new circumstances, and be mindful of the impacts of the pandemic is having on our people and to encourage coordination and support. As we go through the sessions today, you will hear from a wide range of people at OSFI. They will outline OSFI's, OSFI's response to the pandemic, where we are, where we are going and how we will get there. We will kick things off with remarks from our superintendent, Jeremy Rudin. Jeremy, over to you. Thanks very much, Jamie. And welcome to our informational webcast on risk management for deposit-taking institutions. I do regret not being with you in person today. I think it would have been fun to say hello to some familiar faces, and I'm sure I would be marveling at how many new faces have arrived. That said, this virtual format does have its advantages. We can accommodate many more participants than we usually do. And it's just as accessible to people who live and work outside the greater Toronto area as it is for those of you in the GTA. Like Jamie mentioned, I want to talk to you about how Canada's banking system navigated through the pandemic, how we got there today and where it could lead us. The experience of the last few months has clearly shown that the Canadian banking system was well prepared for this crisis. The system entered the pandemic period with the capital resilience, the liquidity resilience, and the operational resilience that we sorely needed. Our experience has also shown that most, although not all, of the things that a prudential regulator and supervisor can do that are useful during a downturn should be done well before the downturn arrives. So let's start by looking at capital. A well-capitalized banking system is essential for financial stability because a strongly capitalized banking system helps to cushion financial shocks, while a weakly capitalized banking system will amplify those shocks. And even though we already had this view in Canada before the global financial crisis, we strengthened our capital requirements in its aftermath in cooperation with our international partners. We not only raised our minimum standards, we also pushed banks to exceed those standards under normal conditions and so created robust capital buffers for use in times of stress. 
The clearest example of this approach is the domestic stability buffer, which applies to the systemically important banks. At the onset of the pandemic, Canada had one of the largest such buffers in the world. Now I'm pleased to say that all of this has worked pretty much as we had hoped. We lowered the domestic stability buffer at the onset of the pandemic, taking it from 225 basis points of risk-weighted assets down to 100 basis points. Now, as it transpired, the most important impact of that move was to clearly signal to banks and to market participants that a measured decline in capital ratios would be an appropriate and prudent response to the deteriorating economy. In the first quarter that was reported after the onset of the pandemic, we hit what I like to call the downturn trifecta. Loan growth rose, so supporting the economy. Loan loss provisions went up because of the downturn. And market participants were unconcerned by the resulting decline in bank capital levels. This was a textbook example of how the capital regime should work during a downturn one where the banking system is able to absorb shocks rather than forced to amplify them. Now, since then, in subsequent quarters, capital ratios have trended upwards in Canada. And this might be a bit surprising given that the economy remains weak, but it's the result of a confluence of three factors. First, banks took the bulk of new loan loss provisions as soon as the economic outlook changed, and that's what the new IFRS 9 accounting standard requires. At the same time, pre-provision net revenue has held up pretty well, and loan demand has been understandably weak. Well, there's more to this story than capital resilience. We also strengthened our liquidity requirements for banks after the global financial crisis. And just last year, we revisited and we strengthened those requirements based on our post-crisis experience. And just like in the case of capital, banks had built up substantial buffers above the minimum requirements, partly at least at our urging. And this too has worked well. Banks used part of their liquidity buffers at the onset of the pandemic when financial markets were severely disrupted. Then timely central bank intervention restored market functioning broadly, which allowed banks to retain some of their liquidity buffers and subsequently to rebuild them. And now that we're several months into the pandemic, liquidity is no longer a pressing concern. Indeed, many banks are awash in deposits as consumers and firms moderate their spending. Banks have also demonstrated the necessary operational resilience during the pandemic. And I hope and expect that our work was helpful in this regard. So I know that a few years ago, we ramped up our emphasis on operational risk and on uh, in general rather, and on business continuity and third party risks in particular. And of course, being resilient on the technology and cyber fronts are a significant component underscoring overall operational resilience. So credit has to go mainly to bank IT departments and to the people who approve their budgets. Well, that wraps up my quick tour of how we got to where we are today. Let's now turn our attention to where we're going. I think we can be confident that the pandemic will eventually be behind us. The recent news about vaccines is encouraging and gives us all a welcome boost, as you know. But as the prudential regulator and supervisor, it is my job to remind you that it could get worse before it gets better. And in severe but still plausible scenarios, it could get much worse. As Jamie mentioned, COVID cases are rising in Canada. They're also rising in many of our trading partners. Winter is coming to our hemisphere. Indeed, it's already here. With the prospect of even better conditions for the virus to spread indoors than we saw during the very troubling days of March and April. And compliance fatigue is growing. Finally, we have to be alive to the possibility that other unwelcome events could impact the economy while it is already weakened. After all, if someone had told me a year ago that we would have a global pandemic and a global oil price war at the same time, I probably would have scoffed. But you'll remember that that's exactly what happened in March. Now, if the economy does take a sharp turn for the worse, the highest profile issue from OSFI's perspective will be capital. 
the good news, and it is very good news, is that there is plenty of capital in the banking system for it to be able to continue its shock absorber role. Still, if we find ourselves in another cycle of economic decline or a W-shaped scenario, I expect that we will have to ramp up our communication about how the capital regime works. In that scenario, we will be reminding banks and market participants at every opportunity that Aussie requires banks to build up capital buffers in good times precisely so that they will be available for use during periods of stress like the one we're going through. We'll also have to remind everyone that banks will be given ample time to restore their capital buffers in a transparent and measured way when it comes time to do that. Now it's possible in this W-shaped scenario that we may even need to lower the domestic stability buffer even further. And fortunately, a full 100 basis points of the buffer remains, which is almost half of the level that we had at the outset of the pandemic. We would also have to reconsider the earliest date for contemplating an increase in this buffer, which is currently set at September of next year. Now, some of you may have tuned out a little bit during this section because you are confident that we will move smoothly towards the post-vaccine recovery. And let's hope you're right. But I'm not ready to take that for granted. For myself, I can't stop thinking about the summer of 2008. Well, what about that summer, you may well ask. Well, you'll remember that the financial crisis had kicked off in Canada the previous summer, 2007, with the disruption of the non-bank asset-backed commercial paper market. Not long thereafter, the Bank of Canada be began providing liquidity su support to the financial markets, and that support was quite unprecedented by the standards of the day. By the following summer, however, 2008, the Canadian situation had improved materially. Indeed, it had improved so much that the Bank of Canada was actually cutting back the size of the support facilities that it had launched in 2007. And down the street of the Department of Finance, the powers that be were sufficiently confident about the future that they felt they could afford to put a novice in charge of their financial sector policy shop, someone who had never been an assistant deputy minister before and who had no financial sector experience at all. That was me, by the way. Well, we all know what happened shortly thereafter when Lehman Brothers failed. Of course, we may well escape a W-shaped recovery, but even if we do, the recovery may look very different from the pre-COVID normal. As the governor of the Bank of Canada has reminded us, we could be in for a long, slow and bumpy recovery, which would weigh on credit performance. And if we do have a long and slow recovery, it will be accompanied by very low interest rates, which could weigh on earnings. Moreover, the pandemic experience may lead to structural changes in the economy or accelerate changes that were already underway. These changes will certainly create new opportunities for banks, but also new risks. Now, when the recovery becomes more entrenched, we will look to continue unwinding the extraordinary measures that we took at the onset of the pandemic. You probably know that we are phasing out the extraordinary treatment of loan deferrals that we established in March, but there are still many other measures in place. We only brought in those measures that we judged to be credible, consistent, necessary, and fit for purpose. When a measure no longer meets those tests, we will withdraw it. Now, of all the extraordinary measures that we implemented in the spring, I am guessing that you are most interested in the future of the bans on dividend increases, on share buybacks, and on increasing total executive compensation. Certainly those are extraordinary restrictions and we do not want them to become a permanent feature of our system. So how will we know when it's time to relax some or all of them? The most important consideration will be the extent of uncertainty about the economic outlook. That means that there's no set date nor specific economic indicator that will trigger our decision. We'll begin to relax those restrictions when we get to the point where we think that there are few, if any, plausible paths that lead to a second pandemic-induced setback for the economy. In that regard, I think it's important for you to understand that from our perspective, keeping the restrictions on a bit too long is not as serious a mistake as taking them off too soon. 
If we have the restrictions in place longer than turns out to have been necessary, the capital simply stays in the bank and it will be there to be distributed later when the restrictions come off. If, on the other hand, we take the restrictions off too soon, the capital leaves the bank and it can't be recaptured when it's needed. You're probably watching to see what will happen in other countries that also have restrictions on distributions of bank capital. So are we. We're also keeping in mind that the circumstances in Canada differ from those of most of those other countries. In some countries, for example, all dividends are prohibited. When the authorities in those countries lift that restriction, it will have the benefit of showing investors that it makes sense to put capital into banks because there's a reasonable prospect of getting it out again later. In Canada, on the other hand, we have never banned dividends. We have only prohibited dividend increases. Indeed, we're now into the second crisis of this century where Canadian banks have generally continued to pay dividends uninterrupted, and that prevents a presents rather a very different picture to investors. In yet other countries, share buybacks have been the principal means of returning capital to investors. Dividend payouts pale in comparison. In Canada, the situation is reversed. Why does that matter? Because share buybacks are easy to start and easy to stop. Dividends, quite a different matter. I'm going to complete my overview of our journey through the pandemic with the following observation. None of the issues that we were concerned about before the pandemic have fallen overboard. They have all traveled with us on the journey. That's why we restarted our policy development work and consultations in the fall after having suspended them in the spring. So the first consultation that we uh, undertook during our relaunched period was about technology risk. And that's no accident, because rather than slowing the pace of technological change, the pandemic has increased it. You will also have seen the recent announcement that we are working with the industry and the Bank of Canada on scenario analysis of risks arising from the transition to lower greenhouse gas emissions. We'll be following up with a broad discussion paper on the prudential approach to climate related risks early in the new year. We're also determined to complete the work we started on implementing Basel III, the so-called end game here in Canada, and a more proportional approach to capital and liquidity requirements for small and medium-sized banks. We're looking forward to working with you and other stakeholders on these and other important projects. And like you, we're really looking forward to the end of the pandemic. Well, it looks like I've left enough time to take a few questions. So let's get started. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, now let's see if we do have any questions from our participants. Good afternoon. Yes, we have some questions posted on Slido. The first question, Jeremy, in general, how well are financial institutions faring through the crisis? Sure, thank you very much for the, for the question. So I think uh, for both a banking and insurance point of view, if you're asking about financial institutions, uh, I think that uh, Canada is once again having a good crisis. And I think, uh, as I was saying in my remarks, uh, that uh, the main contributor in this regard is the preparation uh, that uh, both industries have made uh, in recent years. And some of this has been stimulated by our own requirements and supervision. And some of this has certainly been undertaken on their own initiative by banks and insurers, and all of it is paying off right now. Thank you. Jamie, do we have time for one more question? We do. Uh, we have a question on the climate risk discussion paper, and perhaps if you can elaborate a bit more on that topic. Uh, sure, I'd be glad to. I mean, I won't scoop the entire, uh, the entire paper, which will be coming out uh, early in the new year. Uh, and I have been speaking about this uh, uh, recently. Well, recently. Feels like a long time ago because it was prior to the pandemic. But I do have some remarks in February uh, that, uh, that you can refer to that go into this in a little bit more detail. I think the most important part I would, uh, point I would make is that uh, at OSPI, we have a very important role to play 
uh, where it comes to climate change, and that's to ensure that Canadians continue to enjoy financial stability uh, as we deal with climate-related risks. And from a financial sector point of view, those climate-related risks are somewhat disparate. There is the physical risk that arises from change in the climate itself, uh, and that can certainly have implications across the financial sector, most obviously for property and casualty insurers who insure against uh, natural disasters and other climate-related risks of this type, uh, but also for anybody who's investing in the economy, whether they be bank or insurer, uh, because it can have an impact on the creditworthiness of some of their uh, counterparties or the value of collateral. A related but still rather different Risk is posed by the transition that we expect the economy to go through to one which has lower and potentially much lower levels of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's gonna create new opportunities for uh, financial institutions, but it's also going to create new risks. Uh, and that will be an important focus of the discussion paper. And uh, it is, as I mentioned, an important focus of the work that we're doing with the Bank of Canada in cooperation with, uh, with some of the banks and insurers. Um, so that's going to be, I think, a very, uh, very important and instructive exercise. And then lastly, we have liability risk, which is of particular interest to property and casualty insurers who may have in insured companies for liability claims that may eventually arise from climate change. That's something that uh, will be slow to develop, but we certainly can't rule out. So the discussion paper will cover those topics and they'll cover it very much from the perspective of OSFI's mandate, which is as the prudential regulator and supervisor. I hope I answered the question and there's certainly more information to come. Okay. You, Are there any more questions? We have uh, another question on Slido. Jeremy, if things do get worse than they currently are, besides lowering the domestic stability buffer even further, what other measures is OSFI prepared to take? Well, we'll continue to look at the range of measures uh, using the tests that we established back at the onset of the pandemic. We'll bring in things if they are credible, if they're consistent, if they're necessary, and if they're fit for purpose. But what I wanna underline is, uh, the even going into the pandemic, my view was publicly expressed was that banks were well prepared for uh, for an economic downturn, and I think that all of the experience we've had in the ensuing months reinforces that. There's a lot of capital in the system, and there's a lot of liquidity in the system. Operational resilience is good. I think we're well prepared for another downturn, and it's certainly possible that even if we have another downturn, we don't need to do much in the extraordinary way at OSFI but that remains to be seen. Okay, thank you very much, Jeremy, for your comments and for addressing questions. Uh, I think we'll move on to the next topic at this point in time. Um, so next we'll be turning to, um, uh, turning to um, banking supervision more specifically. Um, and the next speakers will our two senior directors within the deposit taking supervision sector. Um, first will be Catherine Dixon. Uh, she is the senior director responsible for the supervision of systemically important banks. And after Catherine, uh, Brigitte Fanouf will make a few comments and she is the senior director for small and medium sized banking group. Um, they will both discuss OSFI's supervisory response observations and the way forward uh, during this pandemic. So Catherine, may I turn it to you first? Yes, thank you, Jamie, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking with you today about our supervisory activity for the systemically important banks and how that's evolved as the pandemic has unfolded. So a number of the financial and non-financial risks that we would have been discussing during the 2019 risk management seminar um, have increased and in some cases accelerated as a result of the pandemic. We've seen elevated risks, an elevated risk environment in general for banking activities, uh, which really affects a number of risk categories. Uh, so of course that would include credit, uh, market, liquidity, operational risk, 
and other non-financial risks. And of course, it was uh, just a few months ago at the onset of the pandemic that we saw elevated levels of market liquidity and counterparty risk uh, that we really had not seen in a number of years. And so OSFI took a number of actions in response to the changing risk environment. And uh, the first set of actions are categorized under operational relief. So OSFI postponed on-site reviews and other activities and made adjustments to the overall supervisory plan to allow banks to deal with the operational challenges linked to the lockdowns, uh, manage the increased financial risks, and also to focus their attention on facilitating government programs and other lending. And in addition to this, at the outset of the pandemic, OSFI provided flexibility on timelines for uh, return filing and also for uh, proposed regulatory return reporting changes. And all of this was uh, to recognize that some institutions may have needed additional uh, time to meet deadlines given the rapidly changing environment. So the, the second category of actions is under the heading of enhanced monitoring. Uh, so the stand down of the on-site supervisory reviews uh, was supplemented by enhanced monitoring processes. And uh, this involved activities such as making targeted ad hoc data calls and also increasing the frequency of reporting for certain credit information uh, using existing data return formats. Also, as part of enhanced uh, monitoring, we found benefit from the use of tools like sensitivity analysis and stress testing techniques. So OSFI has conducted work internally, and we also rely on the bank's own stress test analysis. So using uh, bank stress testing gives us a, a view on the bank's own perspectives on their risks. And it also helps us to understand availability and uh, uh, data availability, I should say, and uh, capabilities within the banks. And this in turn enhances supervisory dialogue and uh, it also may highlight areas of future focus. Finally, uh, we have also relied on more frequent contact with the institutions uh, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic, when it was important to discuss regulatory and supervisory adjustments for the new risk environment. And uh, those communications are continuing, although with less frequency than in the spring. But uh, these touch points are invaluable in terms of understanding how the risk environment is evolving. So just turning to the next slide, uh, the structural forces at play linked to the pandemic have impacted business processes, uh, which include things like uh, changes made to facilitate hardship programs, uh, but also we're continuing to see an impact on financial and non-financial risks. And as we've now settled into a new normal, uh, while we're still vigilant around market liquidity and counterparty risks, uh, traditional credit risk is seeing significant focus right now, and uh, we expect to be uh, continuing our focus on this in the near term. And uh, credit risk has changed in its nature, given some of the government support programs and changing consumer behaviors, and that adds additional challenges uh, from a risk management perspective. Additionally, uh, the structural shifts we're seeing are affecting other areas of risk like third party risk and technology risk. So we will be covering these risk areas in more detail in our presentations later on this afternoon. Now, in response to these changes at this stage, uh, we're seeing the adaptation of certain risk management processes and practices within the banks. And we expect to continue engaging with banks around how they're adapting their risk management practices in the current environment. So this includes things like understanding how cost saving initiatives linked to a more challenging profit environment are impacting risk functions and businesses and how institutions are maintaining their effectiveness. 
Our uh, supervisory approach against this backdrop will continue to be focused on matters of financial resilience. And as I mentioned, uh, we will continue our focus on credit risk. And so we will be focused on expected credit loss practices, strategies uh, that the banks have in place to address credit risk, capital management practices and capital planning given the COVID risk environment, as well as having continuing focus on stress testing. We will be looking into these areas through a combination of virtual onsite reviews, enhanced monitoring practices, as well as dialogue with the banks. In terms of non-financial risks, similarly, uh, this will be managed through a combination of virtual on-site reviews and enhanced monitoring. And this might uh, also include tracking progress on uh, change management and transformation initiatives, such as IBOR, as well as regulatory compliance management initiatives. It also would include planned reviews uh, such as the cloud management review that's currently underway across the SIP sector. So uh, we will also be making use of discussion papers for other non-financial risks. And so this, uh, as an example, includes uh, the technology risk discussion paper, which was recently posted to our website. So in conclusion, uh, the pandemic has resulted in a number of changes and we've had, a, had to uh, rethink how we conduct our supervisory work and we've made use of monitoring uh, data and offsite inspections. And one of our main observations from this period is the benefit of focusing on continually enhancing data capabilities as we execute remote supervision up-to-date data, which is readily available, of course, helps to navigate the rapidly changing environment. And of course, open dialogue and communication has been key. And so we look forward to continuing our conversations as the situation unfolds. And with that, I will end my remarks and pass it over to my colleague, Brigitte. Thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon. Bonjour. It's my pleasure today to speak to you about our supervision of SMSBs or small, medium-sized banks have unfolded over the last several months and what our current posture is as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please, Stephanie. So, so not unlike others, the, uh, the COVID pandemic has required uh, our team to pivot from our business as usual posture. And for us, uh, more specifically, the challenge has been magnified uh, due to our supervising a very large pool of institution and the need to get our arms around our portfolio in its totality in order to quickly assess its potential vulnerabilities. And as noted on this slide, uh, in small and business uh, banking group, we, we supervise around 135 institutions which vary significantly in size and complexity and nature of their business models. So at one end, we have our mid-size or mid-tier institution, which operate a lot like the larger DCIBs and GCIBs in certain Canadian retail and commercial market, um, while not generally being active in uh, capital markets, international banking or wealth management. And additionally, uh, in the small and medium-sized banking group, uh, uh, the small and medium-sized bank operate across a very wide spectrum between global subs and branches, trusts, monoline, and credit card entities. So their market and clientele are often idiosyncratic, uh, requiring a range of supervisory approaches according to complexity of the business model and the level of sophistication. Next slide, Stephanie. Thank you. So we spent the early days of the crisis navigating through the impact of the economic lockdown and various government relief program and engaging with and listening to our institution responded in a multiple multitude of ways and raising many issues and questions along the way in regards to initially the duration of the programs, uh, accounting, reporting treatment, et cetera. 
And it was important for us that we enhanced our monitoring across such a large portfolio, including engaging virtually and more frequently and starting to send out uh, regular requests for additional information. And while the increased engagement allowed us greater hands-on visibility in the early days of the crisis, our main challenge was to enhance our portfolio surveillance in a way that would allow us to detect early signs of stress and vulnerabilities. So the questionnaires that you've seen that we used in the early days of the, pandem the pandemic quickly gave way to extensive, more extensive data calls, which were not always greeted enthusiastically, particularly as time has gone on and they had become more granular. But still, we had a great response from you in terms of turnaround time, and you were patient with us as we tweaked formats and calculation with even the occasional, uh, occasional faux pas on our side. So recognizing that we needed to go deeper into our data analytics capabilities, we quickly redeployed resources in our team to accelerate the development of our portfolio data analytics tools. So over the summer, we completed a number of initiatives that kept our data team busy, including vulnerability and NIM impact analysis, uh, enhanced liquidity monitoring with a particular particular focus on payment deferral data validation and stress testing, as at the time we were concerned about the impact of a potential payment deferral cliff at the maturity of the program. So the collaboration and focus on data by the team paid significant benefits, including be able to share information in a more complete and up-to-date way with our FISC partner, the other uh, government agency uh, partnering with us. So this in turn led to a better understanding of the risk brought about by the pandemic for the small and medium sized banks. And more broadly, it contributed to informing the policy response and achieving a more consistent understanding of the financial landscape across the, the, the FISC part, the FISC members. Uh, next slide, uh, Stephanie. Thank you. So, sur la base des informations actuelles et de notre évaluation des différentes mesures de résilience appliquées on the uh, basis of our analysis and also to the liquidated capital, the portfolio of small and medium size uh, uh, institutions have performed well. Most of uh, medium, small and medium banks have uh, higher levels of uh, regulatory compliance and they raised their operational uh, regulations and also they were diligent and proactive in managing payment uh, uh, deferral uh, systems. Currently, uh, similar, uh, like my colleague just said, also for large banks, we focus more specifically on the uh, evolution of default uh, uh, rates uh, for commercial institutions, uh, residential mortgages, and other uh, uh, retail products. We uh, do also a close review of ICAP and we do uh, uh, FI stress testing capacities, parental support discussions, and also uh, recovery plans by in institutions. There's still uncertainty with this second wave, the lack of visibility on the crisis duration and the potential impact on economy and uh, longer term consumers impact. Uh, impact. So we will, uh, be vigilant, vigilant, and uh, we will be close to uh, be intervene proactively at the first signs of stress. Finally, we are ready uh, to uh, do our review activities virtually. We will focus more especially on uh, privacy, uh, safety of information. And uh, please note that uh, surveillance uh, work uh, depends on the evolution of the current situation. I think that we need to be agile in uh, this uh, time of uncertainties. When we think about the uh, lessons learned during the uh, pandemic, 
we have uh, noted a three different observations. First, similarly to what my colleagues uh, were talking about, it's the importance of having enough reliable and recent data, but also the tools uh, to be able to analyze those uh, data. Also the capacity to adapt our surveillance method and uh, also to adapt according to the different uh, contexts and uh, developments in the current crisis situation, our approach, which is uh, traditional, which is more focused on uh, the institution, uh, needs to, to evolve, ne needs to change. We need to have a more portfolio type of approach. We have succeeded in doing this and we will continue also. And finally, teamwork and collaboration that allowed us to work with our institutions and partner agencies within the governments, hopefully uh, to propose a consistent and pragmatic approach for crisis for medium and uh, uh, small size institutions. I would like to thank uh, my team for their support since the beginning of the crisis and uh, all of you. Thank you for your patience and collaborations. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Catherine and Brigitte. Um, do we have any questions at this time? Hi, Jamie. Yes, we, we have some questions for Brigitte and Catherine. I will start with Brigitte. What are some measures in place or under consideration that would apply for the small and medium-sized banks, but not necessarily for the systemically important banks if a downturn continues? Well, it's a question that's difficult to answer considering that the, the variety uh, uh, of the portfolio uh, I, I think it has to take into consideration the, uh, the, the situation. Um, because in the case of the, the SMSU portfolio, that's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, so I, I really to not to answer, but <laughs> my commentary would be, it would depend on the situation. Thank you, Brigitte. Um, uh, uh, Catherine, maybe you can take this question. How is OSFI ensuring the confidentiality of our bank's information in your supervisory work? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so at OSFI, we are bound by uh, legislation to keep information that we receive in confidence uh, and also uh, keeping information uh, confidential is uh, part of uh, the terms of uh, contract of our employment at OSFI. So uh, I will say that uh, everyone at OSFI does take uh, very seriously information security. Um, but in, in terms of uh, data transmission, because I did talk about ad hoc uh, as well as uh, regular data calls, um, we do have a secure data portal, uh, which can be used for information requests. Uh, and as well, uh, that would include ad hoc requests. Um, and uh, information, of course, uh, may also come in by email, um, uh, which is uh, secure as well. Uh, so I will stop there. Hopefully that answers the question. So Thank you, Catherine. Um, I will add that um, we recently, uh, well, we're still in the process of implementing a new supervisory platform where we do all of our supervisory work. Um, and um, uh, that platform was developed over the course of a number of years uh, with the idea of um, information security was one of the foundational pr principles. So the whole system was developed uh, with um, information security being one of the core principles um, of the design of the system and the controls around the system. So, so we have time probably for one more question. Do we have another question, Bettina or Greg? 
Yes, yes, Jamie, we have uh, we have one more uh, question. Um, Catherine, if, if you can take this one. What future work does OSPI have planned on data and stress testing? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, in terms of uh, data within OSFI, um, we are working to in, um, increase the efficiency and usability of uh, data calls uh, through more modern tools like uh, data visualization um, and just in terms of supervisory reviews and upcoming supervisory reviews. Um, as of today, we have no uh, specific uh, data governance reviews planned between now and the end of uh, OS OSFI's fiscal year, uh, which is March 31st. Um, but uh, as always, there may be observations as we conduct other reviews uh, and also um, as we do our monitoring. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, stress testing, so the MST, the, the macro stress test with the Bank of Canada is upcoming. And uh, of course we expect that to have a COVID flavor. Um, it, it's always possible that we make a, a request of the banks for sector specific stress tests. Um, but uh, as of uh, the current moment, uh, we, we don't have any uh, plans to do so. Uh, and just uh, as a, a last point, uh, we are currently reviewing enterprise-wide stress tests, um, and that is part of the capital management review that we're conducting across the SIB sector. Okay, thank you for that, Catherine. Um, I see we are at 1.48. We are scheduled, oh, sorry, 1.49. We are scheduled to take a break at 1.50, so maybe we will um, move to break in a moment. Uh, if we did not get to your question, um, as I've mentioned earlier, we will be collecting the questions that we don't get to, and we will be responding by email to uh, all of today's participants. Um, so at this point in time, we will move to uh, break, we will re be reconvening at 2 p.m. sharp. So please be back at two. Uh, and thank you very much to Brigitte, Catherine and Jeremy for kicking us off. We will be back um, with some other folks from OSFI to give you updates on their work. Thank you very much and see you at two o'clock. Welcome back. Um, next, uh, we will be turning to our risk support sector. Uh, two people were presenting from this area. Uh, we have Angie Radiskovic, who is our senior director in the non-financial risk group. And also presenting with her will be Matt Glavoda, that is the senior director and responsible for the financial risk group. Uh, they will be talking about continued financial and non-financial risks and impacts of COVID-19. Matt, I believe I'm turning to you first. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. So uh, let me begin by providing a high level perspective on OSFI's approach as the pandemic set in. So OSFI took immediate steps early to reprioritize our supervisory activities on a risk basis. We focused on those areas we believe would be the most heavily affected, the funding environment, market liquidity, credit exposures to vulnerable sectors, control frameworks and operational resilience to name a few. We enhanced our monitoring of institutions to obtain timely insights and identify industry trends as quickly as possible. We also recognize the immediate operational burden on institutions at the start of the pandemic. OSFI, like many regulators globally, paused or slowed down its virtual sup or its uh, supervisory review activities. Now, as of July, these activities has, have resumed, although in an altered virtual form. So COVID-19 has subjected the industry to a significant extreme scenario, one that people may have thought was highly implausible, with the World Bank projecting a global GDP, GDP decline of 5.2% in 2020. Now, there is a famous quote attributed to Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. So this crisis has allowed OSFI the opportunity to observe in real time the adequacy of banks' technical capabilities, their business continuity plans, control frameworks, management reporting, risk appetite frameworks, and the culture needed to maintain operations through such a significant disruption. 
So this presentation will cover the financial and non-financial risks as mentioned by Jamie that have been OSFI's main priorities during the pandemic. We'll summarize how these risks played out in the recent past, as well as how they are likely to affect banks in the future and some thoughts on risk mitigation. Angie will conclude with some reflection on areas of which we need to focus in the months ahead. Uh, so if you go back one slide, it's a, we have a snapshot of the risk support sector within OSFI. Uh, one of the key functions of RSS is to provide expertise to supervisory teams in the areas of financial and non-financial risk. Consistent with this structure, this presentation is organized across these two categories. At OSPI, we have shifted towards the label of non-financial risk to ensure that we maintain strong capabilities across a wide range of risk areas, including technology risk, culture and conduct risk, together with the remaining operational risk subcategories overseen by our operational risk division. RSS also provides important services to OSPI in the areas of risk and data analytics and industry-wide surveillance. So if we could move to the next slide now. So COVID-19 did not start as an economic problem. It is different than the global financial crisis, but COVID-19 has resulted in some significant economic consequences. I think we can all agree that the quick public sector response combined with the increased liquidity expectations of financial institutions since the global financial crisis helped stabilize markets in March and April and has served the industry well through the crisis. We did learn lessons, however, about some key stress testing parameters, particularly with respect to assumptions around corporate drawdowns and the speed with which non-financial events can turn into financial risk. OSFI played, paid close attention to contingency funding plan implementation, including the triggering of early warning indicators and decision-making around both plan invocation and the standing down of plans. Although many banks had similar outcomes, a few outliers will likely receive recommendations and findings through direct supervisory feedback. There were also lessons learned about the hesitancy to use liquidity buffers. We see that more work needs to be done globally to improve communication, consistency, and the understanding of the role of liquidity buffers in a crisis. And looking ahead, NSFR implementation now seems to have an added significance as the need for adequate structural liquidity was clearly demonstrated particularly in the first months of the crisis. So moving to market risk, the market volatility did cause many challenges, but despite the market volatility, banks capital markets operations perform mostly as expected and within stated risk appetite and risk tolerances. Many banks adjusted their operations to minimize open risk and limit losses and in certain businesses did generate a significant profit. There were some losses due to certain counterparty exposures, but overall the system of collateralization of risk, along with the wider adoption of CCPs that has evolved since the GFC, performed well and losses were within tolerance. Now one caveat, we do recognize that strong public su sector support helped stabilize asset prices, which mitigated potential losses in the event of collateral needing to be perfected. So when markets experience large scale swings in volatility, VAR breaches are to be expected. Seeing this, we adjusted our monitoring regime to better inform our supervisory decisions and the consequences for banks. Banks also re-examined their internal risk tolerances and limits and recalibrated based on the increased volatility and the lack of liquidity in some products. So moving on to credit risk in the next slide, um, the widespread extension of payment deferrals slowed the impact of the economic headwinds to retail portfolios. Um, as, as some other speakers have mentioned, uh, the majority of mortgage deferrals have only recently expired, September and October, and have not had a chance to migrate through the payment cycles. Current portfolio performance and risk metrics could be masking potential material negative migration. It is incumbent on banks to be as proactive as possible in addressing portfolio deterioration and have comprehensive plans for addressing a sudden downturn in portfolio performance. COVID-19 will also have an impact on new origina originations as traditional tools such as bureau scores may not capture recent cash flow events adequately. Further, credit bureau scores may not be as reliable as they were prior to COVID and we continue to expect robust underwriting that includes evidence of due diligence on income confirmation. 
Moving to wholesale credit, the majority of the wholesale books have seen negative risk migration as the economic slowdown has lowered top line revenue and profit with resulting credit worthiness pressure. We've observed some changes already occurring in the composition of some of these portfolios. This trend may accelerate depending on the path of the pandemic and banks should be taking steps to manage the risk of protracted higher credit risk in these books. Of course, the impact of wholesale books will, will be uneven as certain industries will experience more acute financial difficulty than others. While the impact for some industries has been immediate, other industries such as office space rental remain highly uncertain. Making good risk decisions in this environment requires access to relevant portfolio data in a timely manner. This data helps to size the risk and undertake scenario and stress tests to better understand the potential outcomes. Banks will, be, will need to be able to act quickly to address emerging risks in these books as they become apparent. IRB banks should also be aware of the impact that increasing risk will have on capital ratios as risk-weighted assets across the wholesale book begin to increase. OSFI will continue to ass assess severe but plausible stress events and the effect that they can have on loan performance, losses, and the risk distribution of the portfolios. The result of these stress tests will likely be, will be a key input in developing appropriate supervisory actions. So next slide, please. Now, as much as data is a key business enabler for institutions, it is also the backbone of our supervisory work. Having access to timely, robust, and comprehensive data especially in a crisis, allows us to pivot our analysis and focus on vulnerabilities within and across institutions. We have noted that some specific data asks, such as the oil and gas stress test, deferral stress test, and deferral information, the delivery was slower than desired due to internal capacity constraints. So it is important that banks continue to enhance their data infrastructure and maintain strong data management and government pro governance processes. They must also have a strong grasp of data limitations in the current unprecedented environment. This argues for increasing the ability to ingest new data and be agile in updating or shifting strategies and business processes. The integrity of models and other business tools directly depend on the quality of the underlying inputs. Market dislocations, for instance, ultra low interest rates and possibly negative rates, and government support, support programs such as deferrals can make use of typical, typical data sources a challenge, and in some cases, even give misleading results. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Credit deterioration is expected and evident, evident, yet bureau scores are increasing. This is pointing to delays and potentially a false sense of security, which can come to an abrupt stop with the expiry of these programs. Keeping this in mind will help limit surprises when reality differs from model outputs. On model risk, all models can have blind spots. In a volatile environment, the lack of model responsiveness further necessitates a strong and agile model governance framework. This includes understanding and dealing with model design choice and model limitations and how those impact business decisions. In some cases, by design, Models will ingest and reflect new data and market reality within two to six weeks, for example, bar, bar measures for market risk. In other cases, models might not pick up changes for a much longer period of time. For instance, AIRB LGD models. Overall, the responsiveness of model outputs and whether it's through inclusion of new data and recalibration or model overlays is driven by banks on quality of risk management. We have observed a range of practice in this regard and noted opportunity for improvement in selected areas. As expected, we noted that banks have made conservative changes to their strategies, um, while material model changes and model recalibrations have not yet taken place as they will require a passage of time. So we are paying close attention to model performance and any model overlays banks are introducing as a result of potential lagging impact of deferrals or other relief programs. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Angie for the second half of the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'll cover the next few slides on non-financial risk. Well, given how rapidly COVID-19 landed on Canadian shores and how virulent it has proven to be, it's not in retrospect surprising. The uh, dramatic upheaval and the logistics that banks had to undergo 
to keep staff safe and to continue operating. At the onset of the pandemic, we saw Canadian banks move rapidly to a remote work posture, as did OSFI. Uh, and this placed immediate and significant pressure on operations, including uh, technology infrastructure, staff and suppliers. You'll hear me talk a little bit more about third parties, as well as governance models, controls, and the crisis management capabilities within institutions. The slide uh, before you covers some of the key areas of operational risk that were heightened uh, during the pandemic and continue to be, of course, uh, and gives you a sense for where we were paying significant attention to, particularly in the first few months. Uh, so I'll highlight a couple of these. On business continuity, uh, in the years preceding the pandemic, banks had done significant work in establishing, testing, and refining those plans. And as a result in the pandemic, we saw banks successfully deploy those plans, uh, but the depth and the severity of the disruption required some significant adaptation to those plans. For example, a lot of them uh, referenced um, a disaster recovery site where a lot of people would move over to that site. And that of course uh, didn't work in this situation. Uh, moving ahead, it's going to be key for financial institutions to ensure that their plans continue to be tested and updated as we move ahead, uh, and further disruption is expected as the pandemic evolves, as you all know, if you're listening to the news recently. Uh, we also took a look at some of the return to office plans. Uh, those are very much in a state of flux, uh, and they'll require some significant work as the pandemic continues to evolve. On change management, uh, the remote working environment did introduce a number of challenges uh, related to employee interactions, oversight, security, privacy, technology, and staff health. Uh, and to address these challenges, we saw institutions move to some new processes uh, and use some manual workarounds, which required some uh, new modes of oversight and controls. We'll be looking to see uh, as we move forward how financial institutions manage these changes. And the reason being that exceptions to policies or new processes or controls can lead institutions to stray from their operational risk tolerances. So it'll be important um, for banks to consider how change management is put in place across the organization to implement, manage, and report on new processes and controls. A couple of comments on fraud. Uh, on this topic, there has certainly been an uptick in incidences during the pandemic uh, and the COVID-19 has highlighted how fraud actors are rapidly able to change their tactics and take advantage of the situation. Uh, if you, I was watching the news last night and there was a Government of Canada commercial uh, informing individuals uh, about the uptick in this type of activity. Uh, so it's, it's hitting many different facets of society here. Uh, banks may also be more, more vulnerable right now uh, to fraud due to potentially less stringent or untested controls implemented during uh, this remote working stance. Third parties, uh, this, this took a lot of our attention at the, uh, in the, certainly in the first few months, especially as certain jurisdictions were starting to lock down uh, much more stringently than some others. Uh, and so it was important uh, in terms of the insight in, uh, as to how financial institutions manage those third party relationships. Um, as many of you did, those third party suppliers had to rapidly shift to a work from home environment. And we saw some of these shifts lead to increases in exceptions granted by financial institutions here to the service level agreements that were in place. Uh, and that those exceptions required some new oversight controls and standards to be introduced. Uh, so this pandemic, I would say, has shed far more light on geographic concentration risks. Many of the institutions on this call would have been subject to a third party study, which included a number of insurance companies as well. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to have data on third parties as, as a result of that study. And we were able to see where our institutions were concentrated as an industry in uh, some of these jurisdictions that we were concerned about. Uh, that is a lot of change to monitor, especially going ahead. We're seeing jurisdictions locked down for more extended periods right now. Uh, and so tracking and reflecting on this uh, for banks is going to be important to adequately manage those third party relationships. On transaction processing, 
Some transactional delays or errors were to be expected in the COVID-19 environment, particularly as the new customer uh, support mechanisms were introduced. We saw banks generally able to respond to these challenges throughout the deployment, or sorry, using um, additional resources by deploying potentially existing staff. Uh, and transaction processing remains an important area of focus as customer support measures begin to unwind. You'll see at the bottom of this slide the topic of operational resilience. This is becoming uh, a hot topic in the non-financial risk space. It uh, cuts across a number of operational risks, and this concept is increasingly seen both within Canada and globally as one of the key desired outcomes of strong operational management. It refers to the ability of financial institutions to deliver critical operations through significant disruption, such as the pandemic, but not only this type of significant disruption. Changing business models, the adoption of new technologies, and the increasing severity, frequency, and longevity of operational uh, disruptions, all of these risks were present prior to COVID, but they've advanced significantly since the onset of the pandemic. Uh, we do believe the Canadian financial system has shown a high degree of operational resilience since the beginning of the pandemic um, and continuing to deliver critical services during a prolonged period of disruption in a complicated environment such as this will be tested in the months ahead. We are also aware of the potential systemic operational disruptions uh, and that these could have corresponding impacts on confidence in the financial system. The pandemic is providing lessons in this regard and that we plan to incorporate this through our evolving policy work on operational resilience. Uh, there was an international consultation period through BCBS which just closed a few weeks ago uh, and you will see this topic included in OSFI's technology risk discussion paper which you will hear a little bit more about from my colleague Judy Cameron shortly. Uh, you can also expect to see increasing engagement from us on this subject. Next slide, please. Thank you. We've certainly seen an escalation in cyber risk during uh, the pandemic. And we list here for you some of the um, areas we're seeing it, phishing, seeing in it, uh, phishing is, is an example of one of them. Um, the same cyber risk that is uh, our institutions are exposed to, th your third parties are also being exposed to that. Um, we expect to see this type of activity increase uh, and banks are accelerating their digital transformation projects because of the mass uh, work from home uh, and fact that people are not as willing to go to branches, for example. This is creating additional risks in areas such as ex execution risk and change management, as well as cybersecurity. In response, uh, the technology risk division within the non-financial risk group is undertaking a range of risk-based activities, including cloud security reviews. And we are developing um, communication on best practices related to vulnerability and patch management, for example. Our regulatory framework will also need to adapt to the increasing risks posed by technological adoption and our tech risk papers I had mentioned is the first step in this journey. Next slide, please. Thank you. On compliance, uh, compliance can be difficult in an environment such as this. We've observed some positive developments from the pandemic, including increased urgency in terms of issues management, the close interaction between senior management and the board, and an increased exercise of oversight responsibilities to name a few. But there are shifting priorities uh, experienced with institutions to be able to respond to the pandemic. We see some delays in testing second lines of defense, for example. Institutions should continue to assess the risks coming from material changes to key processes and controls and to track changes to assess and manage this incremental risk. There is also a risk that uh, rapid innovation can come at a cost of appropriate governance. Uh, and alignment with risk appetites. So we wanted to highlight that for you. This is why we are monitoring closely um, developments in this space within institutions and expect to see sustained enhancements in governance, risk and control practices. On the topic of culture, uh, this pandemic has certainly elevated uh, people risk. 
It's been a key focus for us during the pandemic in the non-financial risk space and has presented a test of resiliency for workforces globally. Institutions need to maintain vigilance as changed working conditions and a worsening pandemic may lead to employee disengagement or burnout. Uh, of course, we hear a lot about the uh, impacts to mental and, uh, and physical health, and this can pose an increased risk of misconduct within institutions. Extensive remote working arrangements uh, are obviously going to continue for the foreseeable future, maybe longer, and they may create additional challenges in mitigating people risk. Uh, we see organizational culture as an important element that's significantly shaping, can be significantly shaped by the worst behavior that institutions tolerate. Uh, and in the absence of being physically together, institutions must guard against complacency be a little more creative and vigilant in how to shape and maintain their culture. One, for example, common tool we're seeing in industry is the use of more frequent and targeted employee surveys to get insights into employee sentiment. Next slide. Thank you. So coming out of the global financial crisis, uh, the post-crisis reform agenda created many new rules. And uh, I had relayed to Jeremy in a, in a conversation a few months ago that Every superintendent that I've, I've been under four superintendents now, they always say the next crisis is going to be completely different, something you don't see coming. Uh, and I would say that was certainly the case here. Um, so just to leave you with a couple of key messages, uh, we're looking to institutions now to be performing more and varied scenario analysis, questioning ingrained thinking and fully contemplating outcomes. We're also looking to for them to build structures and tools to help with this, starting with more timely and robust data. Also, in your thinking on data, consider that supervisors will require this data and may call on you from time to time to provide additional data quickly. We did that certainly at the onset of the pandemic, uh, and that um, can continue. And the industry has not always been adept at being able to deliver this information in a timely manner. This is something we are observing. Uh, and my colleague Catherine referenced it in the uh, in her comments earlier. And the final message to leave you with is just to think about how the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified a number of key risks, including demonstrating how non-financial risks can manifest into financial risk very quickly. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Jamie, for questions. Okay, thanks, Angie. Thanks, Matt. Um, let's go right to questions. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Matt, a couple of questions for you. Um, uh, quite a bit of interest around uh, deferrals and government support programs. So uh, question is, is, is there a concern that today's capital estimate could be overly optimistic since credit deterioration may be masked by the government support programs? Sure, that, that, that's a great question. So what I'll say overall, after doing scenario analysis and some stress testing and looking at the availability and the quality of capital across the sector, there are no material concerns at this point in time. So that's the short answer. And I would also refer you to Jeremy's remarks earlier in this presentation. I think Canada is having a very reasonable crisis here. Now, long answer, clearly we are closely monitoring the, the situation and maintaining frequent contact with institutions to assess their management of the current challenges and more importantly, understands institute, understand the institution's particular vulnerabilities. This includes understanding the level and the amount of capital and any pertinent uncertainties around those estimates, levels of conservative and conservatism built into their models. So since the beginning of the pandemic, we've placed a lot of emphasis on enhanced monitoring. And as part of that, we've conducted a series of targeted what if scenarios to ascertain the impact of the crisis under our what you would call an alphabet soup of scenarios, B, U, W, K-shaped recoveries, recognizing that delays are present and models do not have the ability to immediately pick up the changes. So right now, like I said, there aren't concerns, but we are monitoring this very closely and will act as appropriate. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, Jamie, do we have time for another question? Why don't we have one more? 
Okay, uh, for Angie then, uh, similarly, Angie, quite a, quite a lot of interest in uh, how operations at banks are being uh, impacted by the continuing pandemic. Uh, so the question is, has, have OSPI's supervisors noticed any signs of increasing operational risk as the stress of the pandemic gets longer? Yes, of course, uh, we do expect that. We expect uh, something we haven't paid as much attention to in the, in the past is people risk. Um, we do worry about the impacts to the workforce and institutions, uh, how that will manifest in terms of effectiveness of risk management. Um, I did want to actually in the Slido, Greg, there were some comments, uh, questions related to third party and yes. B10 uh, and got a couple of votes. So I just, this is a question I've started getting quite a bit lately. Um, yes, we fully recognize that B10 will require some revisions, probably extensive. Uh, and so if you haven't had a chance to read the tech risk paper that's on our website, please do so. And uh, we look forward to receiving your comments. The consultation period for that paper is up at the middle of December, so there's still a few weeks to go. Uh, and that is something we're looking to obtain some feedback on. Uh, we recognize B10 doesn't quite cover the third party environment right now. There's a question further down in Slido that talks about fourth and fifth parties. That is something we're thinking about, something we have seen also in the pandemic. Uh, third parties subcontract out to fourth and fifth parties. Those parties have also been impacted that really can impact some uh, critical operations of institutions if they're relying on third parties to provide them. So I um, hope that covers uh, the theme on the third party questions in Slido. But yes, the pandemic is a non-financial risk event, uh, which is manifesting into financial risk now. So certainly there are um, massive operational risks we need to worry about. Thank you for that, Angie. I think that takes us to... Um end of time for this presentation. Uh, as we've indicated, we are collecting the questions and we'll, uh, once we don't get to, we will um, respond to via email to all of today's participants. Uh, you may not see your question exactly because there's a lot of very similar themes. So we may put the questions together in themes and answer them that way. Um, we have up till now been focused on supervision. We're now going to pivot to regulation. Um, and we have two people from our regulation sector that are going to talk to us now. Um, we have Judy Cameron, Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs Division, and Bernard Dupont, who's Senior Director in our Capital Division. Uh, they will discuss OSFI's regulatory response and actions during this crisis. Judy, I will turn it to you first. Thank you, Jamie, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of today's risk management seminar to talk to you about OSFI's regulatory agenda. Uh, can we turn to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, this is going to be my agenda for this morning. I'll say a few words about um, the relaunch of our policy the consultations, but I'll try to be forward looking in that. And I will also say something about what we learned from our policy responses to COVID. And then I'll go on to speak about some specific policy or guideline projects that we're consulting on. Now, these sort of fall into, they're presented here chronologically, but they uh, really fall into two categories. We have two discussion papers that you've already heard referenced, and then we have three guidance projects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of um, the relaunch of our policy consultations, well, it's been a busy year on the policy front. We started uh, the year off quite normally, and then all of a sudden COVID hit, and we suspended our policy consultations on all of our guidance projects because both financial institutions and OSFI needed to reprioritize resources toward immediate COVID impacts. At that time, we were focused on developing temporary regulatory measures as a result of these impacts. And my colleague Bernard Dupont will speak to our criteria for that work in a few minutes. As conditions began to stabilize, we planned the restart of our policy consultations with the industry. And in July 2020, the superintendent announced the resumption of policy development work. 
However, we recognize that the financial sector continues to face elevated risks and uncertainty. So we will um, pace our work and ensure that we that it is measured and responsive to Canada's economic environment. Our guidance development will continue to be forward looking and our approaches will support reasonable risk taking, but at the same time provide the necessary safeguards for depositors and other financial institution creditors. At the end of September, Ben Gully gave a speech um, about our policy priorities and laid out uh, and about how OSPI is adapting to the new normal. Alongside the speech, we also published our guidance priorities for the next three quarters until the end of June 2021. I will be providing updates on risk management priorities before turning the virtual podium to Bernard, who will cover the capital and accounting projects. Next slide, please. Okay, so what did we learn from COVID? Uh, you know, I could spend hours talking about this topic, but I'll only highlight the two most important lessons. The first is that our policy work needs to be adaptable to changing circumstances. To that end, our forward guidance plan focuses on the need to remain relevant, responsive, and realistic in an uncertain world. This means developing priorities that continue to be relevant to OSPI's strategic plan and responsive to greater uncertainty and volatility in the risk environment. For example, by reprioritizing to respond to sudden spikes in prudential concerns. Finally, OSFI needs to be realistic and take both institutions and OSFI operational constraints into account. We recognize that in the current environment, institutions have varying degrees of operational capacity to respond to OSFI requests. And by this, I mean policy requests because we've already heard about all the data requests you're also responding to. As a result, the plan we put forward was different from the plan we would have had in the absence of COVID and may need adjustments from time to time to prioritize certain guidance initiatives over others as they take on added urgency. We are planning for the new business as usual, but we continue to be vigilant so that Canada's financial system remains strong and resilient. The second lesson is the need for open and timely communication with both the institutions we regulate and our regulatory counterparts, both within Canada and abroad. We sought feedback from institutions when we developed our policy priorities. And we did receive assurance that yes, we were focusing on the right priorities uh, and generally the timing seemed reasonable. We continue to have regular and frequent interaction with our FISC partners, provincial counterparts and peers in the international community. I will now move on to speak to current risk management and compliance initiatives. Next slide, please. So the first project I want to talk about, you've heard um, of from both Jeremy and Angie, and I believe Catherine. So it's uh, clearly a popular topic, and that is the technology risk discussion paper. Uh, this paper, which was released in mid-September, covers a breadth of interrelated topics, including technology and cyber risk, third-party risk, artificial intelligence and machine learning, data, operational resilience, etc. And these discussion papers are, are part of an evolving trend at OSFI uh, to engage industry in policy dialogue at an early stage uh, as part of our overall objective of being more transparent. So in this vein, we encourage financial institutions, as well as industry associations, academics, IT associations, and other interested stakeholders to submit both views and responses to the 18 discussion questions included in the paper. To initiate the dialogue, we hosted an industry information session on October 8th, which had quite a high attendance and um, a robust virtual dialogue. We're also planning a few small informal roundtables to discuss advanced analytics with some relevant experts. And sometime this week, we'll be participating in a panel discussion hosted by the Canadian Regulatory Technology Association. Comments received from this paper will shape the nature and timing of the next phase, which could include both further policy work on the development or the development of enhanced monitoring tools for OSFI, so supervisory tools. The policy work might take the form of additional consultative documents or specific, on specific policy proposals or developing new guidance or updates to existing guidance. And Angie has already mentioned the, uh, the need to uh, update and 
uh, revamp guideline B10 on outsourcing. Uh, we also have guideline E21 on operational risk management. We have an advisory on cybersecurity self-assessment, and we may well develop completely new guidelines. So as Angie mentioned, the consultation period ends in three weeks on December 15th, and I would encourage you to provide send your responses because uh, it's with this input that we can best shape our future work. Uh, on a tangentially related note, OSFI understands that the Minister of Finance's Advisory Committee on Open Banking will soon undertake the second phase of its consultations. OSFI is closely monitoring this initiative and participates in ongoing interagency policy work with its federal partners, including the Department of Finance. Next slide, please. So now I will go on to two more guideline oriented initiatives. Um, the first is uh, the proposed revisions to guideline E4 that OSFI issued about a month ago for public consultation. The draft guideline, which applies to foreign banks operating in Canada on a branch basis, includes some key changes to clarify and rationalize OSFI's expectations. Key features of the revised guideline include that it's a single principles-based guideline for both bank and insurance branches combining the former guidelines E4A and E4B. In addition, we've repositioned our expectations to focus on management of the business in Canada rather than the role of the principal officer. These expectations are also aligned with our revised corporate governance guideline, including a one-stop shop approach so we've uh, consolidated a number of the requirements pertaining to the management of uh, branches uh, in, within this one guideline. And finally, it includes updated record keeping requirements that reflect recent, the amendments to the Bank Act following the ratification of CUSMA or the Canada-United States-Mexico Trade Agreement. And these amendments will come into force in July 2021. So while this guideline pertains uh, to branches, so it's somewhat narrow, I know that a number of uh, branches have been very interested in finally seeing it um, be published because it's been a project we've been working on for a while. So now I will say a few words about a letter that we issued in mid-October regarding changes to our approach to supervising banks and life insurers, anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing programs or AML ATF. Key messages in this letter uh, should not be news to this audience because they were originally communicated to institutions in June 2019 at information sessions co-hosted by OSFI and FinTrack. So under the uh, new approach, which we revealed uh, almost 18 months ago, FinTrack is the primary agency responsible for supervising compliance with the Proceeds of Crime Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Act while OSFI is focusing on the prudential implications of AML compliance, as this better aligns with our mandate and authorities. OSFI will apply its prudential lens through compliance reviews under guideline E13. As a result, we're revisiting our guidance framework and are seeking views on the nature and timing of any potential amendments. So our first question in the letter is whether amendments to guideline E13 are needed, either in relation to OSFI's AML ATF supervision or to clarify our expectations for compliance risk management more broadly. The second question is whether guideline B8 should be rescinded in full or if elements of B8 should be incorporated in a revised guideline E13. So you only have a week left. The deadline for providing comments is next Monday, November 30th, but we really do encourage that feedback. Next slide, please. So now on to the second discussion paper that has already been mentioned, which is our discussion paper on climate related risks and that we plan to issue early in 2021. In government parlance, this will be a green paper and will not set out specific policy directions. Through this paper, we want to initiate dialogue on climate related risks that can impact the safety and soundness of both financial institutions and private pen pension plans. And Jeremy did an excellent job of uh, providing an overview of the, the three key risks, physical liability and uh, transmission risk. Through this paper, uh, we want to initiate dialogue 
Oops, sorry. Uh, we're particularly interested in how institutions define, identify, measure, and build resilience to these risks, and the role OSFI should play to facilitate their preparedness and resilient to the resilience to the risks. So this paper also asks a number of questions about how institutions are managing these risks and the challenges they may be encountering. You know, in addition to reviewing the risks, it speaks of, to some emerging practices and what are some of the challenges with those practices, for example, scenario analysis and data challenges. State, stakeholder input will help to guide the development of OSPI guidance or supervisory expectations or both and sub Subsequent public consultations will precede any proposed changes to OSFI's regulatory guidance. So the final item that I'll mention is the status of OSFI's consultation on the benchmark rate in guideline B20. As you will recall, in February of this year, seems like a lifetime ago, OSFI launched a consultation on a proposed new benchmark rate for uninsured mortgages. And at the same time, the minister initiated a consultation on the benchmark rate for insured mortgages. However, shortly thereafter, both OSFI and the minister independently suspended these consultations as part of the COVID-19 response. At this stage, we are not yet ready to return to this consultation because of continuing uncertainty in the risk environment and outlook. However, you can be assured that we won't do anything precipitously. And if we do uh, return to the original consultation or further tweak our approach, there will be ample time for consultation. So this concludes my remarks and now I'll turn it over to Bernard. Merci beaucoup, Judy. Bonjour tout le monde. Thank you very much, Judy. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to talk with you about our equity and accounting rule changes. First, I would like to recap changes linked to our regulatory framework uh, related to COVID-19 in the last few months. This will give you an idea of the majority of changes, even if most were took place during the first six weeks. I think it would be interesting to mention the reason why what motivated our changes first to reduce the load on financial institutions and then to make sure that our rules are based on, uh, on, on, on even during pandemic, on the uh, regulatory adjustments. So on March uh, 13, we announced a reduction from big banks of the domestic stability buffer by 1.25% with measures to preserve capital for all financial institutions. We also have uh, paused uh, a lot of work and meetings. At end of March, we announced several regulatory uh, measures, the most important ones on the slide in front of you. During that period, we have increased significantly our efforts of communications in the industry with stakeholders and the general public to make sure that our objectives were well understood. In July, we have announced the restart of our policy development work. And I will uh, mention this a little bit later on. On August 31st, we announced the phasing out of our uh, the uh, temporary uh, preferential capital treatment of payment deferrals for uh, insurance premiums and uh, mortgages. On, uh, uh, and then we have and mentioned that by the end of 2021, banks could keep excluding central bank reserves from their ratio cal uh, leverage ratio calculations. To conclude, we are still considering considering rather if we are if we need to adjust our regulatory requirements to guide us in which changes we need to implement. We use four principles that I'll be describing. Next slide. Thank you. At the beginning of the crisis, we see different needs developing in Canada and elsewhere through several actions. Without principles or criteria, decisions, decisions would have been impossible to make. So we have developed a, a framework to help us make proper decisions. OSFI is looking to changes and making sure that all regulatory 
changes follow the following principles that they are credible, consistent, necessary, and fit for purpose. Changes need to be credible because it is uh, crucial to preserve our reputation that we've built along the years. Our change needs to be well understood and based on risk and in line with international standards. Our changes also need to be consistent. Me measures need to be similar for similar risks, whether it is a large or small bank or an insurance company. A good example is the application of preferential treatment to deferral payments for insurance companies, both for loans and uh, mortgages. As well, changes need to be necessary. And that is a very important principle for us. Before a change, we need to make sure that reasonable alternatives have been explored. To conclude, the changes need to be adapted to circumstances fit for purpose. Here, changes need to be based on the risks that in institutions face. If the intensity of risk change because of government support or any other event, well, we will adjust the model. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about the lines of what we call our business as usual uh, projects. Again, business as usual doesn't mean we are stopping our work on possible changes due to COVID-19. We will, of course, continue to assess whether to unwind, extend, or otherwise adjust our uh, regulatory relief measure related to COVID-19, taking into consideration the guiding principle I just discussed. But since the situation is a bit more stable now, we have turned our attention back to resuming non-COVID related policy work that was in development prior to the pandemic hitting in March. First, the domestic implementation of Basel III reform package focus on revision to the car and leverage guideline, which cover adjustment to a series of area, including credit risk, op risk, market risk, the output floor, and the definition of capital. We are also developing a set of pillar one capital and liquidity requirements that are tailored for small and medium sized institution or SMSBs. This involved the creation of a new guideline for SMSB capital and liquidity requirements. For both of these initiatives, we are targeting conducting a public consultation in spring of 2021, ahead of finalizing the rule by end of 2021 for implementation in Q1 2023. In addition, we are reviewing our current regulatory guidance and monitoring practices related to unencumbered assets and pledging and considering whether any adjustments are needed. We intend to consult publicly on any revised expectation in this area in 2021. Uh, next slide. Finally, we have also relaunched our business as uh, usual policy work on the accounting side. Of course, you will not be surprised that the first element we're looking at is the ECL interaction. As we continue to explore issues with the IFRS 9 expected credit loss accounting model and how it interacts with the regulatory capital model, OSFI is focused on understanding the issues further and determine if changes are required to the regulatory capital requirements, i.e. the CAR guideline. On Pillar 3 uh, disclosure, OSFI is aiming to issue a draft Pillar 3 disclosure guideline for DCIBs uh, open for public discussion consultation in uh, early 2021. The draft guideline will basically consolidate the BCBS Pillar 3 Phase 1, 2, and 3 disclosure guidelines and templates into our domestic guidance. OSFI is aiming to issue a discussion paper in early 2021 specific for SMSBs. The discussion paper will explore whether the Pillar 3 disclosure requirement aligned with the tailored Pillar 1 SMSB proportionality initiative. Finally, on the assurance on capital and liquidity return, 
Uh, OSFI is aiming to issue a discussion paper in the first quarter of 2021 for banks and insurers. For banks, we want to explore whether the capital, leverage, and liquidity prudential metrics should be subject to external audit, similar to the practice that has been established for insurers, whereby the LICAT, the MCT, and the MICAT returns are audited. So thanks everyone. This concludes my remarks. So now I guess I'm back to, to you, Jamie. Okay, thank you, Bernard, and thank you, Judy. Uh, I know we have a number of questions, so why don't we get to them right away? Thank you, Jamie. Um, so our first question is, uh, appreciating the crisis is not yet over. Do you think the regulatory framework has worked as intended, or do you see the need for policy change? And if so, in what area? Um, I can kick this off uh, and then I'll turn it over to Bernard because there's sort of many angles to this question. So I think at a high level, as Jeremy mentioned in his remarks, um, the regulatory framework has worked as intended because our institutions could handle um, the liquidity crunch at the beginning of the crisis. So we had ample liquidity buffers and we uh, have strong capital buffers and the framework's um, design is to make sure that institutions are resilient. Um, so, so far, yes, it has worked as intended. Uh, in terms of risk management guidance, it tends to be very principles-based and flexible. So it can adapt to a crisis or business as usual environment. Um, and in terms of the capital frameworks, I, I would turn it over to Bernard to see if he has any early observations. Uh, thanks, Judy. Uh, just like you said, and as Jeremy said, uh, I think the uh, regulatory framework has worked uh, very well during the crisis. Uh, the good news is now we even have uh, more experience about the crisis. So for the future, as the uh, crisis unwind, we, we have a little bit more experience as to uh, what changes we could do. Uh, long term, I, I don't foresee uh, major changes to uh, at least the uh, capital rule due to uh, the, the crisis. There might be some tweaks. Uh, we might need to be a little bit uh, better prepared for when a crisis hit, what kind of uh, adjustment are necessary. And the stress bar is one that comes to, to mind for me. Uh, you know, it's an adjustment we need to make. But we need to be a little bit more prepared and upfront about uh, the changes. Same thing with uh, pillar two, how, how are we gonna use this in the crisis? So we need to be a little bit more prepared before the crisis hit as to how we would uh, use this during the, uh, the crisis. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we probably have some other questions as well. Yes, we do, Jamie. Um, I think this question is for Bernard. Does OSFI think that its relief measures were balanced in terms of providing flexibility for the small, medium-sized banks as much as they did for the bigger banks? Uh, great. Thanks. Thanks. That's a good question. Um, of course, I, I think they were balanced. Uh, the uh, when, when I look at the major decision we took and the major changes that, that uh, occurred, uh, they apply to, uh, to both the SMSBs and the uh, DCIB. So when you think about uh, ECL, uh, deferral, uh, the uh, leverage exclusion, uh, stopping the uh, consultation, everything applied to uh, everybody. Uh, some apply just for the uh, SMSBs, like uh, the flexibility on the use of Pillar 2. Um, we, we might say that we didn't reduce the uh, DSB for the uh, SMSBs, but of course it doesn't apply to them. So uh, I guess it, it's like if the uh, DSB was uh, always been at zero for, uh, for them. So from that point of view, I think the, uh, the changes we made were uh, very balanced. Okay, thank you, Bernard. We probably have time for one more question. Uh, this, this question is, uh, I think, for Judy. 
why is OSPI focusing on cybersecurity, advanced analytics, and the third-party ecosystem as key areas of technology and related risk? So um, the focus on cybersecurity, advanced analytics, and the third-party ecosystem uh, reflect, you know, an observed increase in, in risks in these areas. For example, the number of uh, cybersecurity incidents such as data breaches, technology outages, etc., um, as well as shifts in the severity of the risk. Um, and as we've also seen on the third party side with more reliance on third party increased risks there. Um, we've also um, noted emerging risks that both FURFIs and regulators should better understand, such as artificial intelligence and quantum computing. So we're trying to be forward looking. You know, artificial intelligence brings many benefits, but it's not without risks. So, but the, as I mentioned, the paper covers a broad range of risks. And if there are other risks that aren't identified, then um, respondents are encouraged to, to cite what those would be. Uh, on across all of the technology risks, um, OSPI has identified, identified that sound data management and data governance are critical. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bernard and Judy. Um, I think maybe we will turn to our final speaker of the day, uh, and that is Mark Hughes. Um, Mark is the chair of the Global Risk Institute and is also a member of the board of UBS Group. Uh, Mark today will be sharing with us some insights on the evolution of board's focus during the pandemic. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you today, uh, albeit virtually. I have attended a number of these sessions over the years on the audience side, of course. I always found these uh, sessions very useful, and they clearly demonstrate the great working relationships that exist between Canadian financial institutions and OSPI. As Jamie has said, I will touch on how a risk committee and a board of directors operated through this pandemic crisis. As I work through my points, I'm sure you will recognize similar approaches that your institutions have taken. I only have one slide and I've organized it this way as we started uh, at the top of the list back in March, but as the weeks and months passed, we added to the list, but also revisited each item. At UBS, the risk committee started meeting weekly in March virtually and all board members were invited to attend. We moved to every two weeks in June and are now back to our regular schedule and attendance. A COVID-19 report was started and discussed at each risk committee where the CEO, then the COO, then the CRO, then the CFO and treasurer all contributed and presented to the risk committee. I'm not sure how each Canadian bank communicated with OSPI in this regard, but this report has been forwarded to the Swiss regulator FINMA each week since March. UBS did benefit, if I could use that word, from having extensive operations in Asia, so that by the time the crisis was hitting Europe and the Americas, lessons were able to be applied from what had occurred in Asia in the months prior. The first item we discussed and continue to discuss at every meeting was how were our people doing, how many have recovered, and how many cases did we have, and where, and sadly, had any of our people passed away. We quickly started to add in details of how we were operating globally. Over 90,000 employees were enabled to work remotely. Over 3,000 new employees were onboarded remotely and we had 99.9% .9 system stability throughout provided uninterrupted connectivity for employees and clients. We instituted a technology chill in March and April to focus efforts on operational resilience. Of course, with this massive shift in how we were working, the next risk committee item of focus was understanding the operational and compliance risks. How is supervision going to work? How did we ensure this was not just an open doorway to cyber attacks? How are we going to handle workflows 
to deal with backlogs caused by a fourfold increase in the number of alerts that had to be worked through. These are the type of questions we were asking uh, management at that point. While we were still in March, as all banks saw, drawdowns and margin calls ballooned. Liquidity in the global banking system was certainly tested. A debate that can occur over the coming months could be what would have happened if the Fed and the world central banks had not intervened. In addition to draws on existing loan commitments, it was around this time government loan programs were established. From what I have observed, the two programs in Switzerland worked as well as any globally. In addition to these loan programs, regulators were announcing actions such as the ability to use buffers. I think OSFI was quite progressive in its approach here. As the FSB has just reported, bold and decisive actions by authorities sustained the supply of credit to the real economy and helped maintain global st stability. A significant topic at the risk committee and the board was what should we do about the dividend? As Jeremy noted in his comments, our main objective, as well as FINMA's, was to ensure we had sufficient capital to underpin our risks and our balance sheet, which at that point was seeing RWA increases due to draws and downgrades. As this capital focus was not just where we stood in March and April, but in the future months as we overlaid stress scenarios. In Switzerland, dividends are paid once a year in arrears. So the decision during March into April was what to do with the 2019 dividend. In the end, we paid half with the other half held in reserve for a decision to be made later in the year, which as it turns out was actually made last week and will now be paid. With loan draws, margin calls, falling equity markets and collapsing oil prices, the focus turned to credit risk. Forbearance in a few forms was established, but at the risk committee, we started to have deep dives into our various credit portfolios. Just to highlight examples of the obvious, we discussed the oil and gas portfolio and the structural prote protections, both commercial and real estate portfolios, leveraged lending and the syndicated loan underwriting commitments. This also caused us to circle back to reviewing our operations as we saw an 800% increase in operations volumes. A three to four times market volumes were handled and over 25,000 new loan applications as part of the government program had to, be deal with, had to be dealt with. UBS operates on a calendar year basis and we reported our first quarter results in April. At both the risk and audit committees, we had a lot of discussions on loan provisioning, stress testing, and accounting. As UBS is an IFRS 9 bank, this was really the first crisis where this changed accounting convention would be used. For those that know me, you will know I have some pretty strong views on IFRS 9. We spent quite a bit of time on the assumptions, the proportions used between the baseline and stress, and of course, on the management overlays. During the year, we have now been through this exercise twice more for the second and third quarter results. Back in March and April, the questions of the committee were, committees were more on how bad could this get. During the year, the questions moved to how long would this go on and what type of recovery curve did we expect? As we moved into the summer, we started to focus on second and third line reviews of how we were doing through this crisis. Enhanced monitoring was implemented and reported onto the risk committee, focusing on fraud, remote access, employee conduct, unauthorized trading, and, compliant, and client complaints. Internal audit reviewed some 134 risk items. Our external auditor was asked to consider whether we'd had any diminishment of our control environment with an extra focus on aspects such as cancel and amends and non-regular settlements. As we have moved into the fall, we've been focusing on what the return to office looks like. What lessons have we learned? How should we think about a number of HR related aspects such as hiring, training and potential COVID fatigue? And what risks and opportunities are there as we move into the new normal? As Megan Butler of the FCA has said, the longer working from home goes on, 
the more controls, culture, and relationships are at risks of breaking down. At this point, approximately 30% of UBS's employees are back in offices and branches in Switzerland, but only five to 10% are back in the United States and the UK. We just had a presentation to the risk committee on how we were using lessons learned to inform our new enhanced operation resilience program. As has been mentioned here, operational resilience is a topic that is getting increased attention by global regulators. While UBS, as many banks on this call have demonstrated strong operational resilience through this crisis, we are using our experience to better understand how operational resilience fits in between BCM and recovery. With the second waves hitting most countries, we are back at the top of my list. Starting our last risk committee call, last week actually, with details of how our people are doing. We have introduced a monthly pulse survey to help us do this. And moving through the list again is demonstrated by further discussions in Switzerland on whether we need a second wave of loan programs. To conclude my prepared remarks, given this setting, I think it is fair to agree with the comments made by Alex Brazier of the Bank of England recently, where he said what has worked has been the reforms to the banking system so that this health crisis and macroeconomic crisis has not turned into a banking crisis. That is not to imply that I think we won't see any further considerations of lessons learned for the banking system. The Fed intervention in March and the global liquidity being obvious examples of where further thought is likely to be focused. I would also say that I do think the boards, risk committees and executives of most major banks including most definitely the Canadians, have responded early and effectively through this phase of the crisis. We all must now remain vigilant as we move into the next phase. Uh, thank you, and with that, Jamie, I'm happy to answer some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, uh, for your comments and for being willing to take questions. Um, so I'll turn it to Greg and Bettina. Okay, a um, couple of questions for Mark so far. Uh, the first one is, what are the top three things boards will be focusing on for the next six months? Uh, okay, um, maybe I would answer that actually, um, both uh, from a risk committee and from a board perspective, as I think the answers are slightly different with, with some degree of overlap. If I started with a, with a risk committee, um, I think the, the two main things that will be continued to be highly focused on uh, for at least the, the coming months will be on operational risks, as, as you were hearing in, in uh, this uh, session, um, uh, operational risks, uh, we do need to have extra vigilance on uh, as we continue to work from home, uh, the new uh, procedures and processes that, uh, that need to be thought of and just a constant checking that everything is still working the way it was supposed to. Um, and then uh, the second big one in the risk committee, I think will continue to be credit risk. We had, as I mentioned, a, a big focus on that uh, early on, um, but uh, as we move now into what hopefully is a recovery phase, we still have a lot of individuals and businesses that have had increased debt burdens. Uh, either they, they might've been unemployed or their businesses might've been shut down. Um, so what is, what is the credit risk that is, that is going to take place? How do some of the, uh, these people actually repay some of the government programs that they might have uh, drawn down on? So I would say ops risk and credit risk would be the two big things uh, at a risk committee. Um, from, from a board, I think it's a bit more of a strategic uh, thought process. Uh, what does new normal look like? And what does return to the office look like? What are the, uh, the risks and the opportunities of that? Um, whether this is going to change uh, um, cost requirements, uh, what is commercial, what does the real estate look like? Um, uh, what are the, the need for uh, as many people to be in offices? What do recovery sites look like um, going forward? Um, certainly the crisis I think has advanced almost every bank's uh, digital uh, uh, agenda. Um, so what is that going to look like uh, going forward? And then uh, certainly I, I think all of the banks will also be uh, at the board level uh, trying to look at how can the banks continue to be the solutions to clients' challenges as, as they move to recovery. Uh, in the, you know, the, the financial crisis, 
uh, banks were were under a lot of pressure for maybe not being that uh, that good and maybe the cause of the crisis. Um, here, so far, the banks I think around the world have, have helped because they've been part of the the solution, keeping the economy uh, moving, um, keeping lending going, and I think that uh, desire to continue to be the solution would be should be uh, should be the focus of many uh, bank boards. And then the the final point I'd make, which overlays perhaps the risk committee and the board is uh, we are in, a, in an era of relatively strange geopolitical times, whether it's you know, what's going on in the United States or what the relationship with China is or what's going on in Eastern Europe. Uh, there's still some very, I think, big geopolitical pressures. And these geopolitical pressures, when you overlay things like country risk, uh, might be escalated because a lot of uh, countries of the world have had to increase their debt burdens uh, to, uh, to, to deal with COVID. Um, how are those countries uh, going to be able to, uh, to handle uh, their uh, economies? Uh, presumably, they might have to think about raising taxes, which would, might, would be, might cause, again, this sort of geopolitical aspect. So both, I think that overlays both a, a risk committee and the board. Back to you, Jamie. Okay, I think we have a, a question that harkens back to your um, CRO role. Um, so, Greg, Bettina? Sure, thanks, Jamie. Uh, Mark, the question is, as a former CRO of a Canadian bank, where should regulators be focusing that has not been discussed? Uh, um, that's an interesting one. Um, I, well, maybe an example of uh, how uh, at UBS, uh, we've talked about operational resilience at both the risk committee and, and at, the, at the board. And um, there's been a number of discussion papers from global regulators uh, on operational resilience. And uh, one point that we've definitely tried to, to make um, has been uh, the, the, the global uh, playing field. Um, what would be, a, um, I think, a problem uh, that could occur on, on what is a hot topic of the day, which is operational resilience, but could actually, I, I suppose, apply to any of the, any topic, um, is uh, if global regulators institute something for their own uh, uh, region uh, that is at sort of odds or, or conflicts a little bit with what is happening in other regions. Having some sort of uh, global synergy, I think, uh, is definitely uh, very helpful um, uh, in terms of at times, you know, we, we, all of the banks do not want to end up having uh, to, to have increased costs because they have multiple jurisdictions that they have to do the same, same uh, regulation against. Uh, at the regulators, I'm sure, around the world will be looking at all these lessons learned. They'll be looking at what they can do. Um, having some degree of level playing field uh, on, a, on a global basis, I think, would be very, would be very helpful. Great, thank you, Mark. Jamie, do I have time for one more? Um, sure, we can get one more in. Okay, the last one then, Mark, is have the stresses from the pandemic created any special concerns or stresses between the Canadian operations and the parent head office? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say so. I, I, I think uh, you know, we, my reflecting my time at RBC and reflecting my time at UBS or, or what I've seen of any institution through the work I do at Global Risk Institute, uh, at least for the, for the, for the GSIBs or the DSIBs in the Canadian context that have operations uh, in Canada and other locations, I think there's been a very good overlay between um, the global view of stress and then a, a regional view of stress. Um, you know, if you if you are a global institution such as UBS, uh, you've definitely had to do stress tests in the United States. You've had to do stress tests in in uh, in Europe, in the UK, um, in in Asia. Um, you know, it, it definitely would help if it was one sort of stress test. But uh, you know, it, it, you know, we do recognize that what uh, supervisors and regulators need to manage is the home host concept uh, to make sure that if you are um, not the uh, if you're if they did the branch or the or the subsidiary in the, in a country uh, that that particular branch or subsidiary can continue to operate in, in a crisis and obviously from a from a parent perspective you want to try to manage your uh, as efficiently as you can liquidity and capital um, so you do have you know enterprise stress tests and then you do have these regional stress tests 
uh, to, to try to give you that. I, I've certainly found in, in the organizations that I've worked with, uh, balancing, I guess, that regional versus um, uh, global aspect uh, is, is always a, a bit of a challenge, but I think it has worked very well. And certainly what I've seen during this crisis, it, it has worked very well. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, Greg, Bettina, just wanna check that concludes the questions we've received. For Mark. Can't. As everyone who knows me, Jamie, I always like to try to finish early so you get an extra few minutes uh, right. back into your schedule. Well, Mark, we appreciate uh, your insights and we appreciate your respect for everybody's time. Um, okay, well, then maybe we'll move to wrap up here. Um, I hope that everybody found today's webcast informative. Uh, and you have a better understanding of the things that we at Austria are continued to be focused on and concerned about. Uh, my thanks to all of you uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us and participate. I'd like to thank all of our presenters and, uh, and all of my colleagues at Austria that help organize the event. Uh, just because it is virtual doesn't mean that there is not a lot of organization that goes on in the background. So thank you to the whole team that uh, facilitated that. Um, this afternoon, you will receive an online evaluation by email asking for your feedback. Your responses are important to us. Uh, so please take a few moments to let us know what you liked about today's session and how we could improve. Uh, it is your opportunity to let us know um, what of these set, what is you want out of these sessions, and we do value that input. Especially, we always value, uh, value it, but we certainly do it this these times, given that this is our first virtual uh, DTI risk seminar. So um, uh, your feedback is especially important at this point in time. Um, with that, I will thank everybody. Uh, wish you a good rest of the day. Be safe, be well. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.